gentlemen, Don Lane. sound terrific. You really do. Nice smiling faces. It's all good. Hi, I'm Don Lane, also known as the Denim Dude. You haven't seen a commercial, huh? No, I Hey, so they're no close-ups. Did you notice that? No close-ups to me at all. I make relatively few commercials for one reason. Relatively few sponsors ask me. <laughs> Love it. Happy New Year to those of you that know what that's about. Do you know what that means when I say Happy New Year? It's, just, it's the start of the Jewish New Year now, you see? So for those of you who are at home and say Happy New Year, see? The Jewish New Year now is um, 5736, which makes me 872, I think, or something like that. No, that's actually the year, 5736 in the Jewish calendar. I said to a Jewish friend of mine, I said, what does 5736 mean to you? And he said, are you buying or selling? <laughs> Uh, by the way, did you celebrate our New Year, Bert? What, Jewish New Year? Yes. I haven't even finished celebrating our New Year yet. <laughs> <laughs> so when is your New Year? Oh, I do know when your New Year is. Right, that's, we loaned you Christmas. Anyway, um, I read an incredible story uh, today in the papers. Apparently, a Japanese baby who had no father was arrested for interfering with a topless dancer. Look at the look at the look. They're all <laughs> the baby was formally charged by the police with being a slap happy jappy and a nappy with no pappy. <laughs> slap happy jappy and a nappy with no pappy. Keep going, right? Give me the roll on sign. It's all right. We've got a great show for you tonight. We really do. We have uh, some really fabulous guests for you to meet. Uh, first, we have a man who's become an international star. He played the role of uh, James Bond in uh, the movies. And in his latest movie, he is the villain in a film that we're going to show you from cl some clips from, and the man from Hong, K Hong Kong, George Lazenby. <laughs> right. and, uh, George, of course, a lot of people don't know this, was once in a James Bond film with Liberace. Liberace, he was in a film. <laughs> With Liberace, he played 007, while Liberace played RU12. <laughs> also, we have a very funny man and a real nice bloke. Good friend of mine. He's been a hit here twice. I hope he is again tonight. Tony Braddock. Very funny little <laughs> And, uh, we have some of the wildest leather gear that you're ever going to see in your life. We've got Izzy Dye here with a group, and we've got some models to show us some more of the leather stuff and some more of them. And uh, <laughs> it's made by a fellow, uh, his name is Piero, and he has a wonderful little place that we found, and he's gonna, we'll be meeting him later, too, with all the leather gear and everything. Piero. <laughs> Plus, of course, we have the exciting uh, Maria Mercedes will be here. Lovely singer. And uh, the popular and the very handsome Mark Davis. <laughs> Why are you clapping for another handsome fella? You're usually not that condescending. Well, he's younger and he likes to sort of get a chance. Someone has to replace me eventually, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Please, soon. Anyway, um, there's also a lady I've been saying, I'm saving up quite a few words for since she's returned uh, from Canberra. I want to discuss with her the conduct of some of her woman friends at the Canberra conference. Claudia! We'll be here live. No, <laughs> not fair. Somebody to boot. Claudia's friends, you know, Claudia's friends may be nice, but you wouldn't want your sister to marry one. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. You just can't win with Claudia, you know. I said to her tonight, if women had been intended to be leaders, wouldn't God have created them stronger? And Claudia said, didn't she? <laughs> <laughs> I really, I don't like to knock Claudia because uh, she's done more for women's movements than Ford Pills. However... <laughs> 
you better be here tonight. We're going to discuss some things with it. I know. Save it. Save it. It wasn't really honest. It was sort of forced. Like, oh, help the kid out. He's up there struggling. <laughs> and of course, our very special guest tonight, a man that we're just thrilled to have here with us because he is probably the leading music talent in the world, I think, and uh, just a brilliant guitarist and a fantastic singer. And we're really going to enjoy having him here. Jose Feliciano. <laughs> And speaking of music, if you will all give us a hand or something, we'll get rolling, okay? Here we go, Brian. Yeah. <laughs> For once in my life I have someone who needs me Someone I've needed so long For once unafraid I can go where life leads me Somehow I know I'll be strong For once I can sense what my heart used to dream of Long before I knew Someone warm like you Will make all my dreams come true for once in my life I won't let sorrow hurt me Not like it's hurt me before For once I have someone I know won't desert me I'm not alone anymore For once I can say this is mine, you can't take it Long as I know I have love I can make it For once in my life I have someone who needs me for once I can touch what my heart used to dream of long before I knew somebody warm like you will make all my dreams come true. Once in my life I won't let sorrow hurt me Not like it's hurt me before For once I have someone I know won't desert me I'm not alone anymore Hey, for once I can say this is mine You can't take it Long as I know I have love I can make it For once in my life I have someone who needs me All of you out there missed some of the good parts that go on. We have a nice little prayer meeting in here before we start this segment here, didn't we? Yes. Lie, they're worse than me. Right. <laughs> I want you to see something. Before we introduce our next guest, there's a movie out uh, at present called A Man from Hong Kong, and it has some pretty exciting scenes in it. Uh, we want to show you one particular scene that features our next guest, so have a look at this now, and then I'll come back to you, right? Look at this. Hey, listen, everybody. I presume you've all heard of Kung Fu. Well, it so happens we have a well-known exponent of the art here with us. I was wondering if you'd like to see an exhibition. Just a little one. During which I may break your back in front of all these people. I did not come here to play games. I hope you know what you're doing. I've never met a Chinese yet that didn't have a yellow streak. So where would you like to have this exhibition, huh? Over there? Or over there? Thank <laughs> you. 
notice how a lot of people sort of compare his style to mine? You ever notice something? <laughs> anyway, I want to introduce to you now a man who, apart from being a movie star, is a genuinely nice fella. And I did uh, Celebrity Squares with him a while back and really enjoyed his company, so I invited him down here tonight. And I want you all to meet him. Girls, you're going to love him. George Lazenby. Yeah. <laughs> I, this is the first time I have ever talked to a James Bond. I've lost my voice. You've lost your voice? <laughs> Don't do that to me. We had enough trouble tonight. <laughs> you know. First of all, tell me, George, about uh, James Bond. Why did you... You did one James Bond movie, you, uh, 007, and why didn't you do any more? Uh, to cut a long story short, I kind of uh, had the idea in my head that I could go on to better things. Mm -hmm. And I just left it alone. And uh, it didn't work out that way. Well, how many how many guys were actually up for that uh, part, the James Bond role? You mean you weren't there? No, I wasn't. <laughs> well, everybody else was. Were there that many, really? Well, it looked that many when I started. Mm -hmm. We thinned them out a little. And and did you have to do a series of screen tests for that to get the part? Uh, yeah, quite a few. That's how I learned to act. <laughs> you mean you weren't an actor before? No, I was well, a male model. You were? We well, you have to put your head down. There's a lot of male models around. What does that have a connotation? I think it does, yes. A lot yeah, of people I think if you're a male model, you walk funny or something, right? Yeah, well, the girls go around okay, but the guys just weren't acceptable. So I thought, well, uh, you know, yeah. try out for something better. Okay. <laughs> okay, now, how did you get from uh, being 007 and then having that sort of phase out and get yourself to Hong Kong? Now, you spend most of I must explain first. You spend most of your time in Hong Kong now doing these... Kung Fu movies. Yeah, the last two years I've spent doing it, mostly in Chinese. It's the first one I've done in uh, English, but it's a long story, and it all started with, uh, well, after I did James Bond, I went sailing on a boat to kind of get my head together and, and my feet back on the ground, and there was a lady with me who uh, got pregnant. By, by uh, you? Well, I couldn't bring the fishes. There was oh, I see. <laughs> So, uh, well, I did tell Australia. I said, it's no big deal. Anybody can do it. <laughs> yeah, my father did. Did he? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, I sent her off to Spain to sit with her mother while I figured out what I was going to do. Mm. And. Uh, no, it's all right. Go ahead. Go ahead. Talk. Talk. Don't make me <laughs> And I. Uh, um, I, had to, I had a boat at the time, as I told you, and I had to get rid of it. So I took it to Monte Carlo, whereas. Uh, the best place to sell it because the Monte Carlo rally was on at the time. There were lots of people walking around who'd like to say to their friends at a dinner party that night, I just bought a boat. So I put up a sale sign up in mine and uh, sat there with it, you know, smoking a cigarette in the deck and uh, waiting for a guy to come past. And an Italian uh, dentist who I wouldn't go to said, I'll buy your boat. <laughs> How much do you want for it? And he took it off me. And uh, I went back to London and uh, lived like James Bond for a while on the money. And a friend of mine, who's a bit of a dandy, came over from Paris and said, look, I got a quick, fast way of making a buck. Mm -hmm. I'm um, doing this gambling scene. I said, well, look, I want to get into the movies. So I went to the movies in Leicester Square to see what's happening all around me because no one was making any tracks to my door at the time in London. And uh, he was Bruce Lee fabulous guy floating around the screen. I said, well, I can't do that, but maybe I can be his buddy on the screen. So I saw it underneath it, uh, Singapore Distributors Cafe, blah, blah, blah. So I bought myself a couple of, uh, uh, one ticket, and this dandy friend of mine said, I'll go along as your manager. He was mm. a gambler. He used to be another male model in uh, Paris with me. Mm. And I said, fine, you just look the part. You can do all the talking and I'll uh, tell you what's going on. So when we got, uh, the night before we went, he said, let's make some money before we go so we can, you know, really live it up big. And I said, well, I've only got 200 pounds left for my money from the boat. And my lady's in Spain, and i got to, you know, do the right thing by it. Yeah. And he said, well, 200 pounds is enough. So I took 150 with me along to this gambling place. And we were going great, but he brought a couple of girls along, and uh, our mind started to wander, and we weren't following the system that he already organized, and we blew it. So you were broke. Well, I had 50 pounds left, but then he said, uh, sorry, mate, I can't come. And I, he said, but you can have my ticket. And I said, what's good to another ticket to me? Yeah. And uh, he said, Try and find someone rich to come with you. And I said, I got eight hours. <laughs> <laughs> Not much time. Yeah, right. So well, I, offered, I, hope, go on. 
Yeah, well, no, I, I just wanted to try to move it along. So, you got the Singapore. Yeah. Is that right? On mm -hmm. a, uh, from what we were talking about, you got the Singapore on a, on a freebie ticket or something, or it didn't cost you. Oh, no, the right. his ticket. He gave his ticket. Yeah. yeah, right. And when I was in Singapore, I had uh, a secretary with me, you know, way out in front type of lady. It was a good front. A good looking secretary yeah, right. with a lot of front. Yeah, yeah. right. I got it. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> And she was uh, running around finding out what was going on in the movies, and we found out that Run Run Shaw was the guy that was in charge. Who? Run Run Shaw. That's his name. Yeah, but he wasn't in Singapore. Run Me was in Singapore. Run Me. That's his brother. Run Me Shaw. Run Me Shaw, yeah. So I went to see Run Me Shaw, and Run Me sent his son, Run Me King Shaw. You're, put, you're not putting me on no, because this I'm is true. <laughs> run Run Shaw, Run Me Shaw, and Run right. King Shaw. Yeah. Okay. And I felt if he has a son named Rick Shaw, I'm getting out of here. Now that's <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I felt that uh, it was time I met this guy, and uh, and run me King Shaw came running down to my place, <laughs> picked me up, and I went to his place. And the funny situation was, when we got to the gate, there was a guard up there with a shotgun, and I said, "What's that all about?" And he said, "Don't worry about it. I've been kidnapped three times. <laughs> I don't want the fourth time to happen." Oh, right. Because they run him across to Kuala Lumpur and uh, ask the father for the money to give the son back. You know what they're doing, kidnapping? Yeah. So uh, then the, the dogs were barking at the gate and we went in through the gate and uh, we stopped in the car and he said, uh, don't get out. And I said, don't worry, I won't. <laughs> the dogs up at the window, you know, I couldn't see through them for the lick marks. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he got the dogs hidden away and then I went inside and run me short. Sure, it's nice to meet you, but you must meet my father, uh, my brother. He's in... Uh, Hong Kong, Run Run Shaw. Right. And that time I was about to change my name to Run Run because we <laughs> have <laughs> run all over the place. Meantime, you broke with all of it. Yeah, right. right. So you, get, you get to Hong Kong now to see who's the first lady that you saw in the movie. Yeah, I hustled a ticket and I went to Hong Kong and uh, when I got there, I, I went straight to Bruce Lee's office because I didn't want any more running around. You know, yeah. these guys run here, run there, go there, come here. And uh, this guy uh, said, look, I'd like to meet Bruce. And he said, who are you? I told him, George Lazenby. And he said, uh, oh, and, uh, and I said, James Bond. He said, oh, very well, you can meet Bruce. Bruce, I have James Bond here to meet you. Would you like to see him? And Bruce says, no. <laughs> so it really, all this way. really makes you So secure. I just sat there. You know, I was out of wind, out of breath, out of money, everything. And finally, Bruce came out of the uh, editing room, whatever he was doing, and uh, ignored me there for a while. And finally, he asked everyone to lunch and turned around to me. He said, you come to lunch? I said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we went to lunch, and we got along fine. You know, in the car, we swapped a few names that we knew, and uh, et cetera. And all the people stood up in the restaurant for him like they used to for me when I was James Bond. And we went through the whole thing. He's a real, he was really a, a big hero there in Hong Kong, wasn't he? He was a... The king of Hong Kong. I mean, we got pulled up by a policeman on the way. Mm. I shouldn't say this, I suppose. No, go ahead. It's all right. His wife was driving the car. I was sitting next to her with his secretary on my knee, and he was in the back with a bodyguard. And he, this guy, cop was sort of giving his wife a lot of lip, you know, and I was looking at Bruce, and then he bent down like this. He said, Ah, oh, Mr. Lee, <laughs> the police escort to the restaurant. Is that right? I, uh, I just wanted, I want them to see one thing from Man from Hong Kong, and then we'll get back and uh, we can sort of wrap this up. Uh, this is a car chase, which you are not in, but it's really an exciting piece of film, and this film is now showing here. Oh, I just drove film. it for Did you? No, no you're <laughs> I, mean, I knew you were. Take a look at this. I just want you to see this car chase here.
just before just before we wrap up with George and George leaves us, I just want to tell him one thing. When they're doing those movies, those kung fu movies in Hong Kong, tell him he nobody there speaks English, you see, except George. <laughs> <laughs> so tell him how you do the dialogue. Well, this is not Captain Man from Hong Kong. We had an Australian crew on this, you know, and they do speak a kind of English. But meanwhile, uh, <laughs> yes, right, yeah, sort of. Yeah. So uh, when I first got there, I had an interpreter. He got fired because he was bluffing. You know, he didn't yeah. really know how to interpret Chinese into English, and nobody does. Really. So uh, <laughs> the guy said to me, the director, he said, uh, "You got to uh, do this scene and say this dialogue here." And he'd run through the movements, and then the guy'd get over there and move his dialogue, and I had to count the number of times he moved his mouth. Right? Yeah. And then I'd go over there and say whatever I liked and move my mouth with the same expression. And this is the way it was. And I said, well, why, why don't you worry about the dialogue? He says, it's not important. It's just to get us on to the next fight. <laughs> <laughs> so they dub in the yeah. dialogue at the amount of times you move your lips. Right. Yeah. What, do you what did you really say? Can you tell me? Uh, Never mind. I don't no. want to get in trouble. You know? <laughs> Too many people watching. <laughs> right. <laughs> we have to move along. Ladies and gentlemen, would you thank him, please? George Lazenby. We'll be right back with the Rainbow City. Don't go away. Hold it, please. Five, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, five, six. You know, it's uh, amazing the things that are coming onto the market right now. And we have something here that I'd like you all to uh, have a look at. Uh, this one is no exception. It's, uh, you might say, well, apart from being a nice looking light, What's the difference? Would you say that? I don't think you'd say anything at this point. I mean, <laughs> now look, I'll show you what the difference is, all right? Watch closely. No fumbling around for the switch. All you do is just touch it, you see? You just touch this chrome part here, and presto, it lights up. There's no trick to it, you see? And if you just want to touch them again, well, hello. <laughs> there you go out. Wait a minute. <laughs> That's good. There, there, there. <laughs> All right. It's almost a game of musical lights there. These are called touch lights, and they're really fascinating, you see? And uh, if you, any of you are interested, and if you want to know about trade inquiries, you can call Dome Electrical Products, 69 Flinders Street, Mintone. And the phone number is 550-2402. And they have... Uh, I suppose all sorts of guarantees on it, and really an attractive and exciting sort of light to have in your house. Okay? So you can go out and get one. Touch lights. We gave you the number. Give them a ring. Maria Mercedes is singing the Vi Greenhalf song. I feel the earth move. <laughs> Maria Mercedes.
Maria Mercedes, she really sings well, doesn't she? Huh? Doesn't she? Yeah. Yeah. I don't hear anybody talking to me here, you know. Okay, uh, in the future, by the way, Mar 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 uh, <laughs> Maria Mercedes, in the future shows, you've got Frida Ford, Clarissa Chevrolet, Violet Volkswagen, Gertie Gogo Mobile, and Teresa Toyota. <laughs> we, um, there's a show coming on Channel 9 on Thursday night, and it goes on at what time? 8.30, is it? 8.30 on Thursday night, 8.30 on Friday night. It's six hours of television. And I have to tell you, I saw this twice in America, it's six hours of the best television you're ever going to see. It's a program called QB7. It's based on a novel. And uh, it's, I don't want to give a lot of plot away to you or anything because it's really good to see it from the beginning. And as I said, it's in two parts. Three hours on Thursday and three hours on Friday. If you miss it, you're crazy because it's going to be the best viewing you ever saw. We want to show you a little excerpt from QB7 with Ben Gazzara and a lot of other people. So, have a look. My wife had the child last night, and she is well this morning. She was lucky. My men tell me you thought she would not be well. I could have made it much easier for her. You know, you puzzled me. Uh, what do you really want from us? Well, there is enough suffering in the world which cannot be avoided, and the doctor wants to treat that which can be. Hmm. My wife, uh, she's a nurse. Please, would you let me bring her here to stand by me as I treat you women? Well, I cannot see how this can profit you. It is my profession. But my profession is to be a trader, and I, I do not give things away. Now, if you will excuse me, doctor, I sense that somewhere you must have fallen from God's grace to want to give of yourself this desperately to strangers. If one examines it, one finds out that your first novel was about peacetime flying, yeah. your second and third novel was about wartime flying, and your fourth about fornication. Peacetime fornication. I still have the one about wartime fornication to do yet. Now listen, honey, I'm not a very profound man. I wake up every morning very happy there's money in the bank. Oh, I don't believe that of you. I think you know there are obligatory themes for a man in your time and place. Nothing is obligatory for a writer. Israel will soon be at war with the Arabs again. There's your chance to connect. And write about wartime fornication at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, I'll do that. Excuse me, please. Now, you know, David, I have been staring at this woman across this whole dreary cocktail party. You asked for this party, eh? Yeah, well, I'm sorry. I've just been attacked by a female barracuda disguised as a literary critic. It seems I should write something good about the Jews. Uh, our subject, other than beds and aircraft, you know. Mr. Katie, Miss Lewis, does it make you regret any of the things you may have said about Dr. Kellner? None. Kellner was guilty, period. But uh, why... Mr. Katie, Mr. Katie, Mr. Katie, would, would, would you mind repeating that phrase for Eurovision? Not at all. Adam Kelno is guilty, period. Thank you. Do you expect that the current anti-Jewish position of some of the coming states will adversely affect your defense? I believe in the goodwill of good men everywhere. Well, do you consider communists good men? There are good men and bad men in every political movement and in every nationality. Do you consider Dr. Kelno a bad man and yourself a good man? I don't know. We may both be bad men. But my badness has never included the forcible castration and sterilization of innocent men and women. Huh. <laughs> That's QB7, 8.30 on Thursday and 8.30 on Friday. That's the 11th and the 12th. Don't miss it. We're coming back with Jose Feliciano after this break. Don't go away. All right, here's Bertie with some words of wisdom. Bert Newton. Thank you, Don. <laughs> you know, we, uh, we spend so much time in bed that it makes sense to feather your nest with a Kimpton's doona. You can, you can really relax with a Kimpton's doona under the light, warm cloud of fluffy, sanitized, treated, natural down. Look at that. 
Eh? Stays in the air, then floats down. <laughs> no more restless nights caused by heavy blankets and rugs. You can replace all your conventional bedding. No more bed making. Think how easy that'll be, particularly for the kids, too. And see how these channels... Look at this, look at this. Amazing. I'll show you. Can you see those channels? There. See how the channels make it impossible for the down to move sideways, but it allows the down to move down the foot, right? Yeah. To the doona. To reduce the insulation thickness and warmer weather and give you a, a year-round sleeping comfort feeling. Both in standard and large continental sizes, like Big Pillow Slips, Kimpton's Duna Slips protects your Duna and keep it clean. And they're available in a wide range of prints and... <laughs> <laughs> and that's the nastiest thing I've ever had, right? I know you've had trouble with your Duna, so protect it. <laughs> <laughs> they're available in a wide range of prints and colours to brighten your bedroom. Now, here's the gypsy pattern. <laughs> Look at that. That's a gypsy, truly. It'll bring the real pleasure back into making beds. That's your real pleasure for being in bed. I, I sleep with a doona. <laughs> you may know, a Margaret doona. She's probably... Half a doona, keep it in mind, won't you? Okay, those of you in the studio have already seen him here. For those of you at home, ladies and gentlemen, Jose Feliciano. Yeah. Hi, how you doing? All right, good. 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 How was uh, how was the trip? You only got off the plane a few hours ago, didn't you? Yes, that's correct. Well, um, our trip was really fine, and so far the uh, the Aus part of the Australian tour has been very successful. We, um, you know, it really makes me feel good to to be back here and. I meet a lot of uh, new people and pl plus some old friends and things like that. Mm -hmm. You've been up to where? Newcastle and Brisbane? Yes, yeah. we went to Newcastle, Brisbane, and uh, here we are now in Melbourne. We didn't go to Adelaide this year, and I uh, uh, Adelaide any money that we would have gone. Uh -huh. you know, but, but <laughs> <laughs> it said in the uh, I always explain to people. They said in the uh, in the uh, brochures that they sent us that you are an an expert punster. They said. Well, the uh, first example. Yeah, well, I, I I enjoy it. I think it's good to catch people off guard, providing you don't say anything that uh, that is derogatory and things like that. Listen, I I was and this is uh, people will probably laugh, but. I was watching uh, that film clip, or I was listening to it, either way. Yeah. Uh, and I, I really thought that was exciting, you know, especially the, uh, the kung fu part. The driving was okay, but I've seen, you know, I've seen driving scenes like in Bullet and things like that. Mm -hmm. But uh, George, I think, I think George <laughs> did a fantastic job in the uh, kung fu thing. I thought it was really great. I'm glad you liked it. Yeah. 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 No, really. Really. <laughs> Did you ever get the feeling of being sent up? Right? Yeah. Yeah. No, but it's, no, I mean, hey, we, as a matter of fact, right now, um, Don, I'm scoring a movie. Uh, the music for it, and it's a Gordon Parks uh, production, and the name of the movie is Aaron Loves Angela. It's kind of a love story that, uh, it's kind of a love story with a little superfly adventure in it, you know? Uh -huh. well, this, did this come about because, um, uh, I don't know if many of you are aware, he wrote Chico and the Man. Uh, yeah, that's exactly. Christian. And it was for the, for the series. That's very interesting you bring that up. Well, did you write that song for the series, or were you commissioned to write the song for the series? What did you no, I was kind of... Uh, well, I was sold. Um, what happened was this, that uh, uh, James Comack, the producer of Chico and the Man, uh, was approached by my agent uh, in, in America, and they said to him, listen, you know, why not have Jose write uh, the music for Chico and the Man? And he, since I hadn't really had, in America, what you'd call big hits as a writer, mm. um, th there was a lot of doubt whether as to I could deliver or not. And so once they sold him on the idea, and whatnot. Then I went into the studio. I have my own recording studio, and I went in there and we and I wrote the song about really at eleven o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. Had it all ready for them uh, by five in the afternoon, and uh, he came and heard it. And uh, you know, he was he, he said, "Well, you know, glad you know he was really glad that we could do it." And uh, ever since then, it's really been a very successful song, and the series has been great too. Yeah. Did you know that uh, Sammy Davis was going to record that? Or no, I did not. I it caught me by surprise. You know, to hear. Chicago, don't be the 
discouraged. You wrote your first song when you were 10 years old. Um, well, I wrote, yeah, in, it was a rock and roll song called I'm Rockin' and a Rollin'. Uh -huh. And uh, as a matter of fact, I wasn't even rolling and rocking then. I was just playing for school. Mm -hmm. uh, but You concentrated more on music than you did on schoolwork, though, didn't you? Very much so. Um, I, you know, for me, school was a waste of time, and I don't mean to, uh, to put it down because I, I did learn a lot. I learned many things in school, such as uh, to eat lunch very fast. Yeah. <laughs> uh, sleep, you know, <laughs> sleep in class. Uh, yeah, right. That was one of my favorite pastimes, you know. <laughs> uh, because really, music was my whole life. Even as a little kid, I, I, I knew that that was where I was going to go. And there was nothing that was going to steer me uh, astray from that. Mm -hmm. So music was really my life, and it still is my life. Uh, I don't know what I'll do when I'm uh, Frank Sinatra's age, because I don't think I could really retire, you know. Yeah. Let's hope that I, uh, let's hope that uh, maybe I can take some young artists, some people with a lot of talent, uh, and, um, you know, maybe I can help them in their careers, you know? You have some, uh, some very fine ambitions from what I read. Uh, you, you definitely would love to go to Spain and play with some of the classical guitarists over there. And, yeah, uh, I really would, like Segovia. And, uh, I think one of my favorite British guitar players is uh, Julian Bream and John Williams also. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm, you know, it's a funny thing. I think John Williams, I don't know if it's a classical guitarist, but John Williams wrote the music to Jaws. The movie Jaws. Is that right? Yeah. I didn't know. And I saw that film, actually, just a little while ago. They gave us a preview on it. We're, oh, we're that's planning on trying to show something here, too. Oh, well, listen, if you do, nobody will go swimming on the Australian beaches. I'll yeah, I know. I was telling <laughs> <laughs> oh, them that. It's a shocking experience, believe me. You played it. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta hang in here. It's too quick for me. You, <laughs> you, um, you also did some acting parts for the first time in your career, Mick <clears throat> and Wife and a, and a and Kung feature. Fu. A feature role in Kung Fu, yeah. Right, it wasn't as good as George's, but um, I, I had, uh, I played really uh, a Spanish character. They always, when they give you a break in Hollywood, they typecast you, you know, like um, in Macmillan and Wife, I played a Spanish character, Rico Martinez. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was kind of, uh, you know, I could play it because I'm Spanish, and, uh, and it was very easy. I was a classical guitarist, mm. and they tested everybody else for the part, but uh, everybody, you know, they, they didn't pass, so... Mm. so I, I really enjoyed it. It was fun. It was, uh, it's a lot of work because you have a lot to remember. You know, unlike sighted actors who can get away with the uh, cue cards and things like that, yeah. uh, with me, I, you know, I got the script in Braille, and I had to learn a lot of the stuff, you know, and uh, take it by sections because they'll say, for example, okay, tomorrow we are doing the whatever s sequence, and so you have to study the night before. At least I did. Mm. But I noticed that some of the actors, when I worked with them uh, live, they couldn't remember their parts for nothing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What about when you travel? Do you uh, carry Braille books with you or something, or do you keep yourself occupied like a long period well, of I time? Well, I got Playboy in Braille. <laughs> <laughs> if you do, loan it to me, will you? Can you? <laughs> the thing is, no, well, the thing is, they don't have the pictures, which is sad, you know? Yeah. They, just, they, they just have the articles. But what I do is I put people on. I'll be sitting at an airport, and I got my Playboy magazine, and I'm going like this, and I'm, oh, she looks great. <laughs> 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 and uh, do you? Uh, I don't. I don't know whether this is a touchy subject or not. But you, your dog, that is your companion, sort of, can't come here because of the um, quarantine. The law. quarantine laws. Yes. Uh, and um, uh, how long have you been away from him now? Well, it's only been about two weeks. But I, I will say this. You know, now that I'm a, on a TV program that's being watched by everybody, I think uh, I heard that Melbourne has. Uh, two guide dog schools, mm -hmm. and in case they're watching, you know, guide dog schools only do half of the job because what happens to the student who has a dog after he leaves the school? You know, the school doesn't realize that they have to contend with, like, uh, the dogs sometimes are not allowed in restaurants. Uh, a very famous airline, uh, which I flew on to Australia, and it wasn't Air New Zealand. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, they, ha they have this thing where they, uh, they don't want to allow guide dogs on their plane, and if they do, they have to buy a first-class seat. And um, um, in some ways, I think, you know, well, let's face it, a guide dog would not ride well in economy. But what about the, the bloke that can't afford the money, you know? Yeah, that's uh, that, true. That yeah. can't afford to take his dog uh, on first class and has to go coach. So mm. I think that really the guide dog schools and, and the government have the power to really change a few of those laws, not necessarily for my benefit, because I can do without, but I feel really bad about, uh, uh, you know, blind people Less who want to come to Australia, yeah, mm -hmm. you know, who want to come and bring their dogs and whatnot, and they can't. And they allow show dogs, which I think is a waste of time, but... Uh, mm. 
Why'd you get a big Great Dane, teach him to stand on his hind legs and dress him up and tell him he's your manager? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> if the guy wants to argue with you, say argue with him, Charlie. Or with your <laughs> teach him a few tricks like kill. Yeah, right. <laughs> Oh, you're beautiful. So tell me, tell me about uh, what this album you did. You did an album called Ten to Twenty Three. I got off that subject for a minute, and on there, I understand, was included this first song that you wrote when you were ten years old. Is that right? Well, actually, no, I didn't write the song. It was a song, though, that uh, that was very popular. Me living in the Spanish neighborhood, we always listened to Spanish music, and for the time, anyway, it was a song about a <clears throat> a young country boy who wants. Uh, he's got a house, and he's got his dogs and his chickens, but all he needs is a woman to take care of him, which is kind of. Uh, very primitive, you know. I mean, uh, yeah. W at ten years old, I used to think it was a great song, and now that I'm grown up, I see the message, and I really don't don't mm. care for the message because I think women uh, women are basically really good people, and they're meant to do more than just take care of a home and take care of a guy, you know. Uh, there's a lady coming on very shortly. Now. There's a, there's a lady coming on very shortly that'll uh, back all that up, as a matter of fact. <laughs> you haven't had, have you met Claudia yet? Has no, she I've, never, I've never met Claudia, but I, I will say this, that um, there's extremes to everything, you know. And mm. I, I, think, I think that uh, women's liberation is a, is a very good thing in a lot of ways. I think that a woman should, if she works uh, in the same job as a man, should get equal pay. And I think mm -hmm. that... Uh, I, th I also think that she should be treated, uh, and I also think, like, for example, instead of the man always flipping the bill at a restaurant, that the woman should once in a while say, hey, I'll take it this yeah. time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I really do. I really do, because, <laughs> and, and I'll tell you my reasons. My reasoning is this, that all life long, it's always been the man that, you know, takes out the woman and is a charmer and this, this, and buys the wine and everything. And... I really think it would give a woman a certain amount of satisfaction to know that if she wants to treat a guy for dinner, that she can, and nobody can say, well, you know, no, I'll do it because I'm the man, you know, it's uh, equal opportunity, right? Should she pick <laughs> him up at the house and bring him flowers and candy and all that stuff? <laughs> well, I don't know, I don't bring mine candy too much because uh, they get tooth decay, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's I love it. <laughs> Listen, if I was to, it's a sort of like uh, against the rules or something, but if I was to impose on you and ask you to let me take you over here to this uh, stool we have set up, all right. and I handed you a guitar, would you play a few licks for us? Just a well, all right. Things? You know, I'll, um, I'll play a few things, sure. Will you? I'm happy to. Come on with me. <laughs> By the way, we'd like to, uh, we'd like to invite everybody to, uh, to our concert uh, tomorrow here in... Uh, Melbourne and also in Perth. We'll be there in Perthen. Perthen. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, <coughs> can we have a little guitar? Can you hear the guitar? Okay? Yeah, okay. We'd like to uh, play this for all the women's livers. <laughs> and kidneys, too. <laughs> band if you know the song you can hop right along Feelings 
like I've never lost you And feelings like I'll never have you Again in my arms oh, 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 oh. Feelings Oh, feelings I wish I'd never met you, girl You'll never come again All right, I have some terrific news for motorists. Now, I know that a lot of you have probably heard a lot of things said about this kind of a product, but I have here a wonderful little unit, which I'll hold up for you here, and you can see it. That's all it is, and it's called PetraSave. And when it's fitted to the carburetor of your car, it limits and regulates the fuel pressure, therefore saving on excess petrol, on the excess petrol feed, actually, which, of course, saves you money. Now, this is what it looks like, and you compare it to the size of my hand, see? Now, they're made here in Australia and supplied with easy-to-understand fitting instructions by PetraSave mail order direct to you. And it cuts out the middleman profit, you see? And there's a money-back guarantee. You couldn't possibly ask for more than that. They're giving you a money-back guarantee and guaranteeing that this is going to work, all right? So you're assured of saving money with PetraSave. It reduces carbonization, gives you cleaner exhausts, less pollution, and swifter acceleration. And wouldn't some of us really like to have that when we're driving a car? Now, we're already in use on hundreds of cars in Australia. So why don't you be in it, see? 
If you don't believe what they can do, they have testimonials available to you, and you can ask them for them, and they'll tell you about hundreds of people that have used PetroSafe and have been very satisfied with it. So you get the testimonial. You also have a money-back guarantee, so there really isn't anything for you to lose. So why don't you try it? And here's what you do. You send $8.50. Just $8.50. That's less than half the price of other similar brands, together with your name and address to PetroSave, 15 Lewis Street, Frankston, Victoria, 3199. And you can start saving now. Honk, honk. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I was telling you about all this uh, far out leather gear and stuff that we were talking about. So here with the very latest in leather fashions, here is Izzy Dye, his group, and a whole lot of really good looking leather gear by Piero. Okay, here, have a big hand. Come on up.
Good. Good to see you. Thank you very much. I, I'm afraid to look at the good. Uh, can you stand that way a little? Just a minute. Thank you. Uh, we. <laughs> There's nothing like a distraction when you're trying to talk. I want you to meet the man that designs all of this sort of leather stuff, and he has a place where he sells it, and I happened to discover it by accident. And um, he's a really terrific little fellow. Let's Piero, come here. Come on in here. This is Piero. Give him a hand. Come on. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> it's better off if you stand oh, up there. Yeah. Where is uh, now? What do you what do you use mostly in all of this stuff? It's a very leather. thin kind of a leather, isn't it? Of course, yeah. Yeah. Um, there's you know there's a lot of difference um, in the leathers we use. There's uh, hides and small skins and things like mm. this, but this is mostly. I notice most of them are really soft. Like this thing you made for me is all really soft leather. You kind of walk around touching yourself all day with it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Where's the shop? You sell regular stuff besides. These are all like custom yeah, made jobs. Everybody, jobs. just all sizes and everybody. You yeah. know, made, made to measure stuff. Yeah. And these are uh, these these things here would be sort of custom made for them, uh, wouldn't it? Yeah, it would have to be, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, for her it would have to be custom made. Yeah. Yeah. And what about uh, people that just want to come in off the street and stuff to see? That's fine, yeah. Yes. That's, yeah. And where's the shop located? In Burke Street, just opposite the Southern Cross. Hmm. Burke Street, yeah. Well, listen, uh, Nizzi's group is all in your leather gear also, I see. It's all different yeah. kinds of stuff. Well, we do a lot of, you know, pop groups and things like this, you know. Mm. It's just very showy and that, you know. Well, fantastic. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for coming in, and thanks for going to the trouble of putting all this stuff together. You ladies were terrific. Thank you, Rodriguez. A pleasure. And you all shake hands with, that's as far as I can go. And you, <laughs> thank you very much. Fellas, you were terrific, Izzy. Thank thanks again. Piero, all the best with the place, and I hope everybody comes in and buys a lot of your gear, because I think it's terrific. And thanks for my lion's mane, I think it's sensational, really. <laughs> so I don't hang around and do my little strut. We'll be right back after this commercial break with the handsome Mr. Mark Davis. <laughs> The mighty name Marty Phillips, associated with another mighty name, Atlas Electronics, and I can give you my word, friends, you can start dialing right now, 2119555, because we have a feast for you tonight in electronics. Now, let's have a look at this one here. A beautiful cassette recorder here. It's automatic. You've got slide and press button volume controls. A great feature of this automatic recorder is you have twin uh, jacks. These are the international jack systems. Uh, not getting technical, but they're very important to have. And with this is going out for only $42. And with it, we are giving you a rotating cassette rack that will carry 32 cassettes in this area, such as there, or 20 this way there. So $42 there, so phone right now, 2119555. However, if you have a cassette recorder, let's have a look at another Mighty Phillips model here. This is a digital clock radio with a difference. It's AM, FM, will wake you up to radio. And instead of going for the numerals on the dial, it gets back to the old-fashioned system of, say, 3AK, 3KZ, 3UZ, which I think is so far superior. And that is a Phillips II. That can go out for only $42, and we'll throw in this beautiful little solid-state Fairmont there, too. So the name Phillips. Now, that's a very good deal either way. There's your phone number, phone Atlas right now, 2119555, 2119555, free delivery within 15 miles of the metropolitan area. After that, we'll send COD or direct you to your nearest Atlas store. 2119555, now, thank you, my friends. Thank you. I just wanted to show you, because you see, you put that leather like that, and it really feels nice. <laughs> <laughs> it's so smooth all the way down, you know? Okay, I have some questions to ask to our next guest, and I hope I don't get in a fight, because I don't feel like it tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Claudia, here. <laughs> Oh, 
All right. You have, first thing I have to do is I have to get that hair out of your mouth. That's good. Okay. Now, the second thing I have oh, to... Uh, hello, how are you? I haven't oh, seen you for two weeks oh, live. that's right. We did that voyeuristic thing down the cable last week, didn't we? Yes. And you kept jumping up and down. I want to ask a question. We didn't even hear your question. It was nothing to do with our show anything, you know. We just didn't hear your squeaky little voice. That's all. I don't have a squeaky little voice. <laughs> up the cable, you did. <laughs> Actually, that's what I say. Up the cable. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, I just wish you were at the conference, and all these people were at the conference. It was uh, as a uh, much maligned conference, but... Um, on my program this morning on radio, it was very interesting, the women that rang up from the National Party, from the Liberal Party, who said, you know, really, we don't know what everyone's on about. We were not divided. We were not antagonistic. <laughs> it's the best thing that's happened to the 700 women around this country. Okay, Australia. wait, now wait. Now, before you go any further, let me ask you something, okay? Now, I mean this straight. I'm not fooling around because I'm as confused as the next person, okay? Can you explain as clearly as possible what w that was all about there? What went on there? Well, women from around Australia were subsidised to come to a conference because, you know, the economic condition of most women, they can't really pay to come from Darwin, Queensland, Melbourne to Canberra. Subsidised by whom? They were subsidised by the United Nations with $164,000 of overseas people and local people to live for one week in Canberra. All their meals and fares paid. From everywhere in Australia? For any woman that wanted to come to the conference, groups from each district were allowed, were chosen to come on their um, application. Okay. And these are women from, you know, areas where they, they just never meet city women, and city women who never meet women from Dingo in Queensland or from Darwin. And the idea was to break down the isolation of this country so women could get together and work out what they would like to do in this country as a 50% of the population, how they could look at the politics of this country, and 13 other platforms of discussion. Because during the days of this conference that went on from, say, Tuesday till Thursday, there were 94 sessions that women could get involved in. It wasn't only to do with politics, although they were asked to politicize their problems, whether they were problems of isolation, problems of race, problems of economy, problems of understanding feminism. Uh, you know, everything was open, mm. and you could say what you wanted to. I mean, it's much better than a program like this, because you, it was a great session where you could say actually what you wanted to say. And when do I ever stop you from saying what you want to say? It's just that you take so long getting around to the damn thing. I don't think that's really <coughs> true. I think you're just being like the media. You're being patronizing. Flo Kennedy's of this world, the black woman activist from New York who's a lawyer, now, she copped the Catholic Church this morning because she uses her own language, and she would look at you and say, Honey, you represent jockocracy. I don't want nothing to do with you. Represent jockocracy? And that's her term. Nice expression. Yeah. yeah it's lovely. But that's her term, and it's good to be able to use the language well and with your own intelligence and not feel afraid, right, not feel conditioned. Okay, just a minute. Now, you got all these ladies together to sort of trade problems and there were certain problems that you were going to discuss. You said there was a platform of how many? There were 13 areas. Yes. Okay, now who set up that platform? Well, if you wanted to add to the platform, the International Women's Year Secretariat laid down 13 areas of conversation. But if you wanted to put your platform, you could, as many women did, say, well, we'd rather talk about this, so they did. We want to add a paper on this, so they did. It was much freer than a male conference. It didn't have any of the structures that, of the male conferences that I've had to report on. Okay, now I've heard a lot of complaints, confusing ones at times. And just answer know? me, just answer me yes or no. Who did you get the complaints from? Just different people. I know you heard did it on... Did they go to the conference? No, but that's oh, what I'm trying to find okay, out. These are all these phantoms reporting from 500 miles and 300 miles away. But go on, we'll allow your question. You're doing to me what you did to Whitlam. You're not letting me talk. <laughs> now, cool it one second. I just want to ask you a question. Do you, or do you, just give me a yes or no now, do you or do you not think that you got a fair shake from the media? I think most women have made that very obvious. We were patronized, trivialized, and ridiculed by the Is media. Is that a no? <laughs> <laughs> it is an absolute categorical no. no. Gotcha. Okay. Now, if that's the case, do you think maybe that the media didn't do anything for you? because they felt that nothing significant came out of this conference. Oh, no, the media didn't realize that it cut its own head off, because up to that point, I think women, like trusting the police force, trusted the media as a truthful part of our democracy. And all of a sudden, they read all these hysterical lies and all this ridiculous exaggeration, and they thought, aha, 
So they don't report accurately. And it really, this, it got to the stage on Friday. You mean it took this conference for you to realize that the newspapers don't report accurately? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> well, you see, quite often. I could have told you that and saved you the trip to Canberra and almost. <laughs> <laughs> but not in the lives of women. You see, women as mothers and wives are upheld like the Madonnas in our society. And I think they're a bit frowned off that they were put down by being themselves. So you don't think that the media gave you a fair shake, but what significant came out of this that you thought the media should have written about? Well, what significant came out of this that women are going back to all areas of Australia with a great plan, which is one great sheet of what they're going to do to the media. And this, <laughs> I saw a frightened little acting editor in Canberra on Friday, surrounded by women. And I, don't, I think it's taken two years off his life because he couldn't reply to these women when they said, you have lied about us and we would like our right of reply. And he said, okay, well, you'll have equal space and uh, you can put your heading on and you can have your right of reply. But when it got down to the crunch, he decided he wouldn't give a right of reply. So the women marched back again and stood over that little man and got their right of reply. Now, this is what the conference was all about. If the system isn't working for you, will you try and make the system work for you in a passive, intelligent fashion? You don't punch the editor but you talk to the editor. Okay, well, this is all terrific when you have a women's conference in Canberra where everybody is sort of prepared for this thing and figuring something was going oh, to happen. Oh, I don't no, think no, wait, 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 wait. I'm not finished all. again. You know. <laughs> I'm not finished. Equal rights. Now, <clears throat> what happens to these women when it, you just don't like me because I'm nice to you? What happens? <laughs> I am outside. I say, hello, Claudia. She says, what does that mean? <laughs> what? Now all these women have come from this great gathering where they all have found force with each other, right? Yep. You know, like strength in numbers. Inspiration. Oh, inspiration, fine. And what happens to a woman from far north Queensland who has to go back to her country town and carry all these philosophies with you, and a old man belts her on the head with a pickaxe and says, we're going to make a dinner. You know what, I, you know, I'm not trying to be smart. I'm just trying to say, what happens to all of these women now that they have all of these things that you have all talked about and said, yes, we need them. Now they go back to the separate areas. What do they do? Well, she knows how to set up a woman's refuge so that when her husband hits her on the head with a pick, she'll say, right, I'll set up a refuge for other women like me. And she'll get a little force of women getting together to provide a house where they can all go to get away from their husbands who are hitting them on the heads with picks and talk. <laughs> it's simple as that. And you think it'll all work? Well, I can only be guided by many, many women that I normally would have no contact with nor much in common with, but because of the atmosphere of this conference, you found you were in a talking point with hundreds of women that you wouldn't have necessarily had a package deal with. Mm. And the city women were astonished about the isolation of the country women and vice versa. And they're all keeping their contacts. Everyone was writing down telephone numbers and addresses. And I know that, that if indeed we are allowed as women by the cynical, prejudiced men that looked upon us to be able to get together and try and do something. The, there was no idea of suppressing men there. In fact, the word man hardly came up during the conference. The whole thing was, if the system isn't working for any of us, and that meant men and women, let's see what we can do about it. That mm. really was the guts of it. Do you think that maybe um, <coughs> hearing all of this stuff over and over and over and over and over again isn't sort of getting boring for a lot of people, and a lot of people might turn their backs on you because uh, they are doing that? Well, I was saying to, to one of the girls out the back, you know, a lot of it had never, ever been heard by women in this country before that was presented to us by the overseas visitors. And they had never heard the stuff we presented to them before. So it was, um, it was just like going back to school again, really. Were you happy with it? Uh, I think it's one of the best weeks I've ever had in my whole life. Mm. You would. What, what's your position Why in this? Why do you say I would? Because it's just you stomping around out there with all those ladies and saying, yeah, go get them, baby. So, <laughs> you need all of that, boy. That would be terrific to you. You'd love it. There was none of that aggression, mate, I can assure you. There was great love and affection. Really? In fact, half of us all ended up crying together when we were saying, we shall overcome, with tears streaming down our faces. It's the first time she's ever <laughs> touched me on her own. <laughs> I must thank you for giving me such a good platform and the women because it's, you are one of, one of the few television areas that at least the two women that were on my program last week, Edie Van Horn and Juliet Mitchell, were able to say what they wanted to say with some sort of intelligent questioning. Well, and that's I must thank you, I'll make Oh, that's my it. pleasure. It's
It only goes to prove that I am not You're learning. a low-lying chauvinistic dog, as someone once called me. You're learning, mate. Okay, Claudia, we'll be right back with the wheel. Don't you go away. Thank you. Toyota Corona SE, the value more than $5,000. It has air conditioning, radial tires, and heated rear window. It comes from Pit Stop Motors, Elstonwick and South Yarra, Victoria's leading Toyota car and truck dealer. And a return trip for two with Cathay Pacific flying non-stop to Hong Kong. Cathay Pacific fly out of Sydney every Tuesday, Saturday and Sunday morning, so you'll be in Hong Kong for dinner that night. And a $500 wardrobe of superbly tailored Stafford Ellenson clothes. In Stafford Ellenson, you'll feel like a million dollar man. Hi, uh, Bert Newton? Don Lane, I do Mondays. Nice to meet you, Don. Hi, nice, pleasure. Yeah, hi. Very good, good. Hi, very good. Thank you. Yes, you want the leather? That's me leather. Feel it. Nice. Now, just feel how smooth that feels. Feel yeah, it. by gosh. <laughs> yeah. Well, feel it on this side. Here, feel that. Like <laughs> Wait, just, just feel that. Like you know. Who gave that to you, Claudia? No, no. <laughs> the piano right. did that, isn't it? Like, yeah, nice. Sure. Good stuff. Claudia spoke a lot of sense tonight, didn't she? Yes. Yeah, she did. Why don't you like Claudia? I like Claudia, but you I just... don't. You lied to me. You just told me before that I'll... she gives you the. I like her personally. Not <laughs> 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 entirely. I heard this morning on Three A W, and she was extremely rude to Norman you Banks. You don't. She was rude to Norman Banks. To my way of thinking, she was. Well, um, what does that prove? What approves? Yeah, I've perhaps, seen you rude geez. on this program to any number of people. Yeah. I would say over the 18 years in television, I've seen you rude to at least maybe 100 people. No, no. I've seen you rude to those little girls. Well, Bert, I sew and I knit and I like horseback riding. <laughs> That's really nice, don't you think so? And you go, yeah, honey, stick around later, you might win a contest. Yeah. <laughs> you do? Never. I know. No. Who's our first contestant? No chance of reply, eh? No. I may go to Canberra next year. This is L.D. Harrison of Braybrook is our first contestant, Don. Hello, L.D. Hello. 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 Made my day. Made your day? Oh, no. Why, because they just gave you a kiss on the cheek? Yes. Oh, how about a week? Well, Come here, I'll fix that. No. <laughs> so, you're, let me, wait a minute. Please, I, please I have a lot of trouble oh, talking to people in the show. That's better. Isn't that good? Yes. Yeah. We can kind of sit. Well, sit up and down. Doesn't matter. Come on. What else? What, what's the L stand for? Mm -hmm. Lily. Hello, Lily William, how are you? Oh, no, I'm fine, how are you? <laughs> Doris, we call you? Oh, now listen, Doris, there's something you have to do for me. It's very important. Bert, Bert is very sensitive. Is you understand? He? Oh, this, oh. And, and you haven't really said hello to him. You've sort of made a fuss over me. So just say hello. Hello. Doris. That's enough. Come over here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Doris. I'll, I'll get you. Right to and I'll stand over here. Well, see, well, see, you can talk to Doris. Where are you oh. from, Doris? Uh, from Chelsea. Sunshine. Is that is that near Fitzroy? No, no it's near Braybrook. Near where? Yeah. Braybrook. I have a feeling that tonight, Don, that the, the car will come up. Will it? Just see how right I am. If that car goes off, Ken Morgan gonna be in here <laughs> very soon. <laughs> with a scissor. Come on, okay, here, Doris. Get over there and uh, give us a spin, okay? Oh, good one now. Good one. Hey, I've just seen something on this wheel. I've just What's noticed that? that they've shortened the pit stop motor thing to a one -er again. Used to be two. You didn't see that either, did you? Because it's your wheel you always tell me about. Now you've shortened it so they don't really have a good chance to get it. They've only got one out of 26, but they had more before. They had two spots, now they don't have... It. I'll take care of it, Doris, don't worry. They took, they took spots out and they changed them around. Sorry, Doris, I got them going. They took the spots out and changed them around and you didn't say anything. I was going to say, you've got the chance of winning this magnificent Toshiba Boston 6000. It's a four-channel stereo system, complete with AM, FM stereo tuner, and four speaker units. Do you like music? Love it. Do you love this? <laughs> All beautifully contained in walnut cabinets, and the value... Oh, couldn't oh. tell you. <laughs> oh, 
Do you know what the abbreviation BC stands for? A Folklodia. <laughs> How did she throw a voice then? Right through you. Look at you. Like you. Do you know what BC stands for? What? Okay. You got it. And you got the computer. Oh. And the next one? 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 The New World Dishwasher has a two-year guarantee and comes freestanding or built-in. It's available throughout Australia at leading appliance stores. And the firm, famous German... <laughs> the famous German Fat Home Sewing Machine. Fully automatic and with more inbuilt sewing aids than any other machine in the world. Fat, the value approximately $495 by the Housewives Association. And also from Seymour Furs of Collins Street. A selection of furs, leathers or suede, the value 300 bucks from Melbourne's largest and most exciting range. Seymour Furs are the specialists. Did you say fat? Fat. Well, fat to you. <laughs> John is up in a touch, John. <laughs> I, you fancy yourself in there, don't you? you what? Really? You go out to a party this evening, aren't you? No, I do what I do. Oh, I, talk, wait a minute now. Now, don't spread. I have enough bad rumors spreading around now. Sure. Let me... Did, Oh, that's Tell them what, how long do I hang around here after the show? Do I hang around a long time or not? I would say you go to the boardroom to thank your guests. You'd be there 10 minutes, have a lemon squash. Right. Or a bit of lemon, whatever you drink. And then, and then where? Home, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> and every night someone new I can come. Shut up. Come over here. And here's a chance. And at Riley. Oh, no. This is <laughs> uh, 103A. He is a Newton of the seven minutes. Oh, I saw him. Was it Annette, did you say? Are you, are you married? Annette, you like that? You know. Oh, she's separated. I said, put your arms around her. They talk out here so they can hear. Are you, are you, just put your arms around her. Are you separated at all or anything? Yes. Yeah. Oh, you like to feel it there, don't you? Yes. Yeah. If you're done, you'll get it off. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Um, well, yes. All right, but tell me, tell me about yourself. What do you do? Uh, I'm an accounting machinist at the motor registration branch in Carlton. Accounting machinist at the motor registration branch? In Carlton. What does that entail? What do you do exactly? Oh, uh, it's sort of like <coughs> typing. Oh, like typing. Oh, I yeah. see. And you just fill in the things. Yeah. Okay, say something to Bert. How do you do, Bert? Hi, kid. How are you? Oh. Trying Don style, it doesn't work for me. Oh no! Come on, Bert, you can do it. Honestly, honestly, and truly, you can do it. Here, okay. hold, just hold his hand for a minute. Yep. All right, now here's what you do. Look her in the eye. Look him in yes. the eye. Now don't lose the eye. The eye contact is most important. Don't. <laughs> well, you have to. You got to get the lip going like this. Look, look, look. Show the lip. It's an Elvis Presley lip. See you like this. <laughs> Hello, sweetheart. How are you? Go ahead. Hi, sweetheart. How are you? <laughs> I think. Love it. Oh. I've never been kissed by a man before. <laughs> Does that mean I'll be a baby? I'll have a baby. Right here. Well, you'll just get a big pimple on the end of your nose. Like this. Okay. Round that one. Oh. Big one now. Because that's a lot of money. It's got to be 400 bucks, I reckon. Tonight from CBC, number 11, I can tell you what it's worth immediately. Look over here, don't get nervous. Oh, no, all right. Yes. You could win the CBC Bank money prize. CBC Bank, a good bank to know. They're the money managers. They do more than just mind your money. They help you manage it, not just 100 bucks, I don't think, is it? Yes. 100, is it? They're saying 100. Did it go off last week? That's what they're saying. $100, did he? Oh. Uh, what's this, what's that word? <laughs> When the mass strangler gets in the ring tomorrow night, he's going to have to deal with me. You ever see those guys? That would be terrific. What is that word? I can't. Tusks? Is that what that is? Tusks? Yes. What are elephant tusks made of? 
Jewelry is right, and you got a hundred dollars. Isn't that terrific? I love it. If you'd like to be on Don's Wheel, all you have to do is write your name and address on the back of an envelope and send to Don's Wheel, Post Office Box 332, Richmond, Victoria, 3121. Around we go. What's happened to you? I don't it's know. It's leather, right? No, it isn't leather. It's just that. There's something seems to come alive when you appear on the camera, Bert. I yeah. have to admit it. I don't know what it is. You want me? No. <laughs> it doesn't have anything to do with that. It's sort of a, it's a feeling, an atmosphere that you create in a studio. I think an operative word would be nausea would be a good <laughs> one. <laughs> you know I'm only teasing. Sure. No one has more respect for you and your talent than I do. That's right. Thanks, Doc. <laughs> I have Mrs. Carolyn Curtis of Moorabbin to come in next Monday evening on Don's show. And I have Mrs. Audrey... Parks. Parks. Right. Of, uh, Goulabas, Goulabas Street, Doncaster. Right. She put a telephone number in case we want to... Oh, of course, you'll ring it, won't you? He is mad. I am not. She's just the missus. We have to go for a commercial break. I'd like you all to thank Bert, because I thought he was just terrific tonight. And we'll be back with the handsome and talented Mr. Mark Davis. If a picture points. <laughs>